This is Adel Gasly. I'm going to present to you part two of the chapter about DC machines. In this part, I will cover the construction of DC machines. This photo shows the construction of a DC machine in three dimensions with a longitudinal cut showing the inside part of the machine. The main parts are the frame or yoke, which is generally a cylindrical shape. It acts as a cover frame of the machine and carries the magnetic flux produced by the field windings on the poles. Since the field is stationary, there is usually no need to use laminated yoke for normal machines. In small machines, cast iron yoke are used because they are cheap, but yoke of large machines is made of fabricated steel due to its high permeability. Pole core is usually of a circular section and used to carry the coils of the field winding. The pole cores and field windings are mounted on the yoke, which is the stator of the machine. Here stator means non-moving or non-rotating part. The armature is the rotating part of the machine, which is also called the rotor. The purpose of this armature is to rotate the conductors in the uniform magnetic field generated by the field winding. It consists of coils of insulated wires wound around an iron core made of laminated sheets of silicon steel which supports the coils and provides low reluctance path for the magnetic fields. Here lamination is used because the armature coils carry AC currents, hence effect of AD currents and hysteresis should be avoided. Now we come to the commutator. The commutator is a form of a rotating switch placed between the armature coil and the external circuit. It is essentially of cylindrical structure and is made of high conductivity copper segments which are insulated from each other by thin layers of mica. The next essential part of DC machine is the brush assembly. The function of brushes is to collect current from the commutator and supply it to an external circuit in case of DC generators. In case of DC motor, brushes supply current to the commutator from an external DC source. Brushes are usually rectangular in shape and rest on the commutator. The armature is mounted on a shaft and is inserted between the poles leaving a very small air gap which allows it to rotate freely. The shaft is mounted on the yoke through bearings. These are only the basic component of a normal DC machine. Next, I will describe again the DC machine construction through a two-dimension cross-section. This is a cross-section of the yoke frame. Notice how it is circular because it is a cylindrical shape. These are the poles with the field windings for the two-pole machine. Note that the number of poles is always odd because they can't be a north pole without a south pole. This is the armature and its winding. The armature is supported by the shaft which allows it to rotate freely through the air gap between the pole cores and the armature core. Next, we will dig further into the construction of these parts starting with the armature. The most important, delicate and expensive part in a DC machine is its armature because of its complexity. The manufacturing and construction of the armature required a lot of expertise and patience. The armature core, which carries the armature winding, is made of sheet steel laminations. These laminations are stacked together to form a cylindrical structure, as shown in this figure. Note that the armature core is intended to hold the armature winding and create a low reactance path for the magnetic flux to flow. Let's have a look at a typical design of such a lamination sheet. This figure shows a small part of the armature lamination sheet. The bottom part is mounted on the shaft and the upper part is for holding the armature coils. The laminated sheet has slot teeth structure where the armature coils that make the armature windings are located inside the slots. Some structures may also have slots for wedges 
which prevent the winding from getting out of their slots, especially that at high speed rotation, the windings are subject to centrifugal forces. These wedges are placed on the top of the winding coils as shown here. Non-conducting slots liners are wedges in between the coil and the slot walls for protection from abrasions. Therefore, they provide electrical insulation and mechanical support for the windings. Cooling ducts are also used for circulating the air inside the armature, which facilitates its cooling, especially when high armature current is flowing in the coils. For high armature current, the ohmic losses heat up the winding, and if the heat is excessive, it may damage the winding insulations and burn the whole machine. And that's why these ducts are there to circulate air and cool the armature structure. Some of the machines have fan mounted on their shafts, which helps fresh cool air to flow inside the machine through the air gap and the cooling ducts. This photo shows an example of armature winding mounting in the armature slots and commutator. Notice that each slot contains the bottom side of the coil and the top side of another coil. So two coils are usually inserted in each slot. Notice also the thin liner insulation in the slots and the wedges on the top which prevent the winding wires to come out of the slots. Notice also how coil ends are welded on the commutator segments. The commutator is a mechanical rectifier which converts the alternating voltage generated in the armature winding into direct voltage across the brush. It is made of copper segments insulated from each other by mica and mounted on the shaft of the machine. The armature windings are connected to the commutator segments. The purpose of the brush is to ensure electrical connections between the rotating commutator and stationary external load circuit. It is made of carbon and rests on the commutator. The electric contact between the brush and the commutator is not perfect and creates sparks and arcs which are dangerous in hazardous environments such as in oil and gas applications. This video shows an example of how this arcing is taking place between the brush and the commutator. As stated earlier, in the DC machine, the armature winding is placed on the rotating structure, which is the rotor. There are various ways to construct an armature winding. Before we discuss these ways, some basic components of the armature winding and terms related to it should be first defined. Number one, a turn consists of a two conductors connected to one end by an end connector. Number two, a coil is formed by connecting several turns in series. And number three, a winding is formed by connecting several coils in series. So the winding is made of coils which are made of turns. The beginning of a turn or coil is defined by the symbol S, meaning start, and the end of the turn or coil is designated by the symbol F, meaning finish. So as stated earlier, there are a number of ways in which the coils of the armature windings of a DC machine can be interconnected. However, two kinds of interconnection, called the lap and wave, are very common. Note that in the lap winding configuration, the coils overlap on each other, while in the wave winding configuration, there is no overlap, but the shape looks like a wave. Next, we will study each type of coil interconnection separately for the lap and wave configurations. This figure illustrates an unrolled lap winding of a DC machine along with the commutator segment bars and stationary brushes. Note that the brushes are located under the field poles at their centers. 
Now consider the coil shown by dark red lines with one end connected to the commutator bar under number two. The coil is placed in slots two and seven, such that the coil sides are placed in similar position under adjacent poles. The other end of the coil is connected to the commutator bar number three. Now the second coil starts at commutator three and finishes at the next commutator number four. In this way, all the coils are added in series and the pattern is continued until the end of the last coil joins the start of the first coil. This is called a lap winding because as the winding progresses, the coil laps back on itself. Note that this winding progresses in a continuous loop fashion. Note also that there is only one coil between two adjacent commutator bars. If we count the total number of coils of the winding that are connected in series between two adjacent brushes, we will find that it is equal to the number of segments divided by the number of poles. In this case, we have 21 segments divided by 4. Thus, the total voltage induced in these series connected coils will appear across these two brushes. The brushes marking up the positive set are connected together as are the brushes in the negative set. In a four pole machine, therefore, there are four parallel paths between the positive and negative terminals of the armature as shown in this figure. So we can conclude by saying that in a lap winding, the number of parallel paths A is always equal to the number of poles P and also to the number of brushes B. The layout of a wave wound armature winding is shown in this figure. The coil arrangement and the end connections are illustrated by the dark red lines. One end of the coil starts at commutator bar 2 and the coil sides are placed in slots 7 and 12. The other end of the coil is connected to commutator bar 13. Now the second coil starts at this commutator bar and is placed in slot 18 and 2 and ends on commutator bar 3. The coil connections are continued in this fashion. So the winding is called a wave winding because the coils are laid down in a wave pattern. Note that between two adjacent commutator bars there are P over 2 coils connected in series as opposed to a single coil in the lap winding. Between two adjacent brushes there are P over 2 multiplied by 1 over P or half of all the coils. This indicates that in the wave winding the coils are arranged in two parallel paths irrespective of the number of poles as illustrated here. Note also that the two brushes of the same polarity are connected essentially to the same point in the winding except that there is a coil between them. However, between the positive and negative brushes, a large number of coils are connected in series. Although two brush positions are required, one positive and one negative in a wave winding, and this is a minimum number which is often used in small machines, but in large machines, more brush positions are used in order to decrease the current density in the brushes. So in wave windings, the number of parallel paths A is always equal to 2, and there may be two or more brush positions. Also note from lap and wave winding configuration that when the coil ends past the brushes, the current through the coil reverses. This process is known as commutation, and it happens when the coil sides are in the interpolar regions between two poles. During the time when the two adjacent commutator bars make contact with the brush, one coil is shorted by the brush in the lap winding and P over two coils in the wave winding. Because many parallel paths can be provided with a lap winding, it is suitable for high current, low voltage DC machines whereas wave windings having only two parallel paths are suitable for high voltage low current DC machines. 
This video shows how the DC motor armature and its winding are constructed. This movie is on YouTube at the link shown in this slide and also at the bottom of the description. First off we test the core and test OK. Then we test the commutator, bar to bar, test OK. Then we put the equalizer in. Run the commutator and we test OK. Test bar to bar with the cone. Test OK. OK. Now we saw the installation paper in each slot. All the insulation going to the slot. Now we slide the core into the slot and we connect it to the one. We connect the winding to the commutator bar. Okay. Now all the bottom coils are in the commutator and we begin to put the top coil into the commutator. Okay, now all the wire is in the slot and it connects to the commutator. Okay, now then it's trimming the excess paper, insulation paper, coming out of the slots. And this paper will later be folded and covered by a paper strip. Folding the insulation. All the top stack insulation is on top of the cross. Then we just knock it down, make sure everything is down all the way. Okay, now we have wrapped the armature with the fiberglass bending. Uh, we go around the um, armature and connection and we go around the top stick to secure everything in place. Um, again, this is uh, fiberglass bending and it secures and insulates the winding everything in place okay uh, we're testing the DC armature now all the winding has been welded to the commutator all the way around the equalizer is at the bottom.
Okay, now the armature is going to the baker's oven. It's going to be baked for preheat at 200 degrees before it gets dipped in the varnish. Okay, now the armature is uh, coming out of the oven, 200 degrees, and it's going to cool down to about 145 degrees before it goes into the dip tank. is lower into the varnish tank or so called dip tank Time to raise the uh, armature up for the dripping of the varnish. We're going to leave the armature suspended in the air for a certain amount of time so the varnish, the excess varnish, can drip off. See down there, it's kind of dark and dry up. Okay, the commentator is in the lathe, has been undercut. Turn. And the next step, uh, the rotor is in This is the end of this part. Thank you for watching.